All right, hi guys, Justin here from chemistrynotes.com and this is our second video on section 12. Section 12 is kind of like chapter 12, if you will. And section 12 is all about chemical kinetics, uh, the rate of a reaction, rate laws. And let's get started with video number two from section 12. Now in video number one, the last video we started we introduced chemical kinetics and we started to talk about something called the reaction rate. And today I'm going to move into rate laws and the two types of rate laws. And at the top of page one of our notes right here, it says rate laws. What are rate laws? Rate laws are expressions that show how the reaction rate depends on the concentrations of reactants. So, to avoid complications due to reversible reactions, we're only going to study reactions right after time zero. So right when the reaction gets started is when we're going to start to study them. That way, there's no reverse reaction getting in the way. So it says on that first bullet point, to avoid complications due to reversible reactions, we will only study reactions soon after the forward, reac the forward reaction begins. That way there's a negligible reverse reaction. We don't have to worry about it complicating things. All right, so let's start with an example. And this example is going to be how I introduce to you rate laws and what a rate law is, what it represents, what it tells you, et cetera. All right, example. Consider the reaction we originally saw in the last video. And this reaction is two moles of NO2 gas goes to or produces two moles of NO gas plus one mole of O2 gas. So in the last video, we used this to find instantaneous reaction rate and average reaction rate. We're going to use it again for this example. It says, because we're only studying reactions right after T equals zero, right after the uh, forward reaction begins, the reaction rate only depends on our reactant, nitrogen dioxide, NO2, okay? We don't have any products yet, right? All we have is our reactant, NO2. So the reaction rate only depends on the concentration of our reactant, NO2. And like I said earlier, that is because there are essentially no products yet, right? All right, so let's take a look at this reaction. Two moles of NO2 gas goes to two moles of NO plus O2 gas. All right, so what are we going to do with this? How are we going to write the rate law? And what's the next step? All right, well, at the top of page two of today's notes, it says the rate of this reaction or rate equals K times the concentration of NO2 raised to the power of N. We'll talk about what K and NR in a bit. For right now, just recognize that this is a rate law. This is rate equals K times the concentration of NO2 to the N power. And that also equals an expression we saw in the last video, minus delta NO2 over delta T. In other words, minus the change in, change in concentration of our reactant over time. So this is a rate law. K is a rate constant. We'll learn how to calculate it later on. N is the order of the reactant, and it can be zero, it can be a fraction, it can be a whole number like one or two. In this course and in your course, it's usually zero, one, or two, all right? So we are going to break down that rate law up there in the box extensively, but first I just wanna mention a few things. There are two types of rate laws. We will talk about number one first, and then we'll talk about the second one in the later videos for this section, section 12. So there are two types of rate laws. One, differential rate law. Now the differential rate law is often simply called the rate law because it's the uh, predominant rate law. It's used, it's the most commonly used of the two rate laws. So differential rate law or rate law because it's the most common rate law type. What does it do? What does it represent? What does it express? The differential rate law expresses how the reaction rate 
depends on the concentration of your reactant, okay? So this expresses how the reaction rate depends on the concentration of reactants. So reaction rate and its relationship to the concentration. Obviously, as the concentration of your reactant goes down, we'd expect the reaction rate to decrease as well because you don't have as much reactant around to react. As an example, rate equals K times the concentration of NO2 to the N power equals minus your change in concentration of NO2 over time. You notice this time I only boxed up the first two terms. Rate equals K times the concentration of NO2 to the power of N. That's the one that's going to be the most useful to us. Okay, more on that later. Number two is the integrated rate law. And the integrated rate law expresses how, how the reactant's concentration depends on time. Okay, so differential rate law was how the reaction rate varied or depended on concentration. The integrated rate law is how con reactant concentration varies or depends on time. Very big difference. All right. Now we're going to see later on that if you know the form of the differential rate law, well, then you know what your integrated rate law is. And if you're given the integrated rate law, then you also know the differential rate law. Once you know one, you know the other. All right. So which rate law you decide to determine or decide to calculate or to find depends on what you're given in the uh, in the question. All right. So if you know you can find concentration in time, find the integrated rate law. If you know you can find the reaction rate as it relates to concentration and there's no mention of time, well, then you find the differential rate law. All right. And we're going to practice differential rate laws in the next video, integrated rate laws in the videos thereafter. So we have lots of practice on this stuff coming up. I'm just trying to introduce it to you now. But I do have a question. And I'm going to write that question down. And I've underlined it twice. It says, why is it important to know the rate law of a reaction? In the last video, we learned about how reaction rates were important. Right? We had that example with ammonia, how NH3 production could take forever if you used H2 and N2. So that was reaction rates. What about rate laws? Why is it important to know the rate law of a reaction? Well, the answer is in our notes right here, because using the known rate law, like after you find the rate law, a chemist can work backwards to learn the individual steps and the individual uh, mechanistic routes that the reaction takes in order to go from reactants to products. So it says, because using the known rate law, a chemist can work backwards to learn the individual steps and mechanism by which a reaction occurs. All right, double underline, star with a circle, moving on to something similar, but not entirely related. Determining the form of the rate law. So the form of the rate law, that means, is it going to be zero order? Is it a first order rate law? Or is it a second order rate law? And then what do these orders mean? All right. So determining the form of the rate law is the first step in understanding how a reaction occurs. And if we move on to the next page of our notes, we can see how this is illustrated. Here's an example. Okay. We have a new reaction. We haven't seen this reaction before. So we have two moles of N2O5. That's dinitrogen pentoxide, right? Two moles of N2O5 produces four moles of NO2 plus one mole of O2. And this, it tells us this is at 45 degrees Celsius. All right, so we've got the, we've got the chemical reaction, it's balanced, and then they tell us the following. It says, the data for disappearing N2O5, why is it disappearing? Well, it's a reactant, right? Reactants go to products, especially when they're studied at time zero. Boom, straight to products. The data for disappearing N2O5 versus time is in table 12.3 and plotted below in figure 12.2. So if I look at the data table 12.3, as time progresses from zero seconds to, 20, to 2,000 seconds, the concentration goes down. This is expected. It's a reactant. 
it's decomposing to four moles of NO2 plus O2. So over time, the concentration goes down. This is illustrated in table 12.3. It's also shown in figure 12.2. Now, see those two little points there where I've got the, my little hand-drawn arrows? I am saying to you, at concentration of N2O5, the instantaneous reaction rate is a certain level at higher up on the curve than it is down on the curve, and those values change. The slope is less, the slope is getting less and less and less and less as you go down because the reaction rate is getting slower and slower and slower. All right, so those two points were very difficult to see on the graph, but if you zoom in on them, you can find the, the two, the, these two pieces of data. It says, and this was written in figure 12.2 uh, that you just saw in my handwriting. At N2O5 equals 0 0.90 molar, my reaction rate is 5.4 times 10 to the minus fourth molar per second, or a mole per liter per second, all right? At N2O5 concentration of 0.45 molar, right? So down a little bit, the reaction rate isn't as much. The reaction rate is 2.7 times 10 to the minus fourth mole per liter per second. So that first bullet point, N205 at 0 0.90, that's the little X I made on the curve on the last graph. And at N205.45 molar, that's the X I made lower on the graph where the curve is lower. So one thing that you can uh, draw from this is the following star. As the concentration is decreased by a factor of two or cut in half in this particular reaction, so is the reaction rate. So for this particular reaction, we have N equals one, okay? Rate equals K times the concentration of N2O5 to the first power. Why to the first power? Well, if my rate doubles, the concentration doubles. If my concentration gets halved, the rate gets halved, etc. So because that's the only reactant and N equals one, we say that the reaction is first order in N2O5 and it's also first order in overall, all right? So in the next video, we're gonna talk about how to determine uh, what N is and often you're given more than one reactant. So how would we find N and then M and then P? How do we find the orders of all the reactants? And for that, we use something called the method of initial rates. We'll talk about that in the next video, all right?